So people, good day everyone and welcome to this Dubai Advantage uh, webinar series on one topic that is very dear to the growth of the UAE before, uh, now and in the future, which is tech, whether it is uh, used in agri-tech, whether it is related to the financial world, it's also topical for a lot of high growth companies that come to this country to trigger their international growth, raise finance and grow further faster, stronger, and create value. For that, what we wanted to showcase you is where the UAE is today, but also where Dubai has to offer in turbocharging good ideas and create arguably more value than anywhere else, uh, if you are to use this level of jurisdiction. So we are all here, specialists from the government, the DIFC, and various other bodies. So without further ado, let's jump into the topic. And before we do that, why not look into not our speaking lineup, but where the UAE stands today? And if you look deeply, you see that as a global financial center, it is somewhere there. If you look deeply, it is somewhere as a global foreign direct investment jurisdiction. And if you look further, you also see uh, Dubai on the top list of top structuring centers. Now, why does it matter? Because there's only a handful of uh, countries or cities that can actually be on all these three lists. They are called the super jurisdiction. Welcome then to the top five. And that's where the UAE is today. So make no mistake. Uh, yes, the country is tiny, but it has a big ambitions and a framework that is today at the top level in terms of finance and tech. And that's what we are going to talk about. The toolbox has improved substantially. I've been in this country for the past 15 years and it has been incredible, the acceleration of path or wanting to have best practice in all these new uh, verticals. What's changed? A lot. Economic substance is now uh, the name of the game worldwide and impacting low to no tax jurisdiction. Not in the UAE, it doesn't. Actually, it brings us a lot of business because it is complicated to generate sometimes fake substance in some uh, lower tier jurisdiction. But the UAE is a bona fide commercial centers. We have all the services one needs, which triggers quite a lot of migration and group reorganization towards the UAE. There's also substantial uh, in initiatives now on opening up the ability for everyone to actually hold capital, not only in free zones of which we will talk about, but also in the UAE mainland. Expect this to open further, but today it is already possible for a foreign company, not only to hold 100% in a free zone in the UAE, but also domestically in on sovereign territory. And last but not least, there is the DIFC. Uh, it is now a top 10 uh, financial center in the world, uh, a common law center, and it goes much further than just to copy paste what other people are doing. It innovates, it creates new tools, it introduces new, in, uh, new initiatives to help not only the fi well-established finance from yesteryear, but all the people that actually want to uh, reinvent the financial world going forward. So. This is what we will be talking about uh, uh, today. And we're gonna ask yourself, if you are an entrepreneur, which way you can capitalize on this jurisdiction. And we'll make the difference between the mainland where you can come and set up a company and uh, hold it together uh, with a local partner, which is mandatory, or we will also talk about uh, free zone entities, typically the DAFC, where you can hold a company 100%, no question asked, uh, like you would in any other jurisdiction. Welcome to a city that's innovating at the speed of light, fueling exponential realities for today's entrepreneurial visionaries and incubating profound ideas to create the unicorns of tomorrow. <laughs> a magnet for the world's brightest and most curious to create a progressive society for the next generation where limits are defined only by your mind. Imagine a future for your business. Now make it happen. So after this brief introduction, let's look at this ecosystem and uh, 
well, we need to, to, to uh, start with the smart people. So uh, representing Smart Dubai, uh, Rama al Shieh is here to tell us all about the latest initiatives by the Emirate in this space. Welcome, Rama. Thank you so much. So good afternoon, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Before I begin, I would like to thank the Dubai FDI team uh, for giving me the opportunity to show our guests today how Dubai is truly redefine, redefining its governance model in order to uh, embrace the fourth industrial revolution and establish itself as the innovation, startup, entrepreneurship, and most importantly, the digital capital of the MENA region. So given birth to a very small initiative to in our leadership executive office, uh, Smart Dubai was given um, one goal by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, uh, Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE and ruler of Dubai, which is to make Dubai the happiest city on earth. Uh, I would not be uh, a bit surprised if you are now confused. A minute ago, I was talking about innovation and the fourth industrial revolution, and now I'm speaking about happiness. So what is the connection uh, over here? So from day one, our vision was to build an inclusive, holistic, and most importantly, citizen-centric smart city. In short, we are leveraging the power of technology to redesign everyday uh, experiences, to ensure higher standards of living, leading to higher levels of happiness among uh, residents and uh, citizens. So as some of you may know, Dubai is a city called home by people from over 200 nationalities. And as a government entity, how do we see, decide on strategies, initiatives, and legislations that equally and positively impact on? So as a solution in May 2016, uh, we've launched a scientific framework uh, called the Dubai Happiness Agenda, which studies the various needs of people in the city, establishes a cultural uh, baseline, and help us create policies and launch strategies to solve some of the biggest everyday concerns of the average resident and visitor of Dubai. So what have we learned so far? Our learnings from the happiness agenda help us establish three primary roles a government should have today. Transforming citizen experiences, embracing uh, emerging technologies, and building a data ecosystem. Next, please. So the number one pain point expressed by every uh, resident in Dubai is interaction with government services. Numerous service, uh, service centers visits, uh, long waiting lines, unnecessary travels, and piles of paperwork are extremely time consuming tasks and, tasks, and more importantly, not environmentally friendly at all. So as a government employee myself, I, I always say, uh, in today's highly digitized world, uh, humans should not be told to act as a data transfer uh, tools for government entities. So in February 2018, we've launched the Dubai Paperless Strategy. So Dubai Paperless Strategy will ensure that all government to individual services are 100% digital, with no paper being used for internal processes or any customer facing uh, transaction. Uh, we envision once we have completely digitized all services by the end of 2021, uh, we will annually, an, annually eliminate the use of over 1 billion pieces of paper, uh, which equates to 250 million US dollar in cost savings, uh, 125 million, uh, million hours in time saving, and 130,000 trees in environmental saving every year. And just for a perspective, uh, 130,000 trees is five times the size of Central Park in New York. So, of course, over um, with over 300 services being digitized, uh, we don't expect our residents and visitors to go and download 300 different mobile applications. So this is why Smart Dubai uh, has been working with all the government entities, integrating and digitizing um, their respective uh, services and trying to build a uniform uh, look and feel um, digital uh, presence. And these services are today being offered through an application which is called Dubai Now. And currently the application hosts over 120 services from more than 30 different uh, government uh, entities from uh, government and private sectors. Um, let me give you a quite uh, examples about the services that we have, uh, booking hospital appointments, managing residency permits, uh, paying for your petrol uh, through the app when you're at the station, digitally enrolling your school, uh, your, your children and school. And of course, with the current situation with the COVID-19, there is uh, uh, continuous uh, updates uh, about it. 
Uh, moving on, uh, due to the level of personal identif identification that is required when accessing all of these city services, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are uh, wondering how secure is the process. So in October 2018, in partnership with the Telecoms uh, Regula Regula Regulatory Authority, the TRA, uh, we have launched the UAE Pass. So UAE Pass is the secure national digital identity of, of any resident in the UAE, which allows users to digitally access all federal and local government uh, services using a single set of login uh, credentials. Um, more importantly, UAE Pass also provides users with a safe uh, and secure digital signing uh, capability, allowing them to sign any uh, legal documents digitally. Next, please. So uh, though digitization learning citizen experiences, we purely also want to understand, uh, we purely uh, also, we want to understand um, how the power of emerging technologies such as blockchain, AI, um, can help cement Dubai as the digital capital of the region. So um, with that drive in mind, in October 2016, we've launched the Dubai blockchain strategy. Uh, which rests in three main pillars, uh, the government efficiency. And here, basically, we work with government and private sector partners to identify uh, most impactful use cases that can be developed for the city. Second is the industry creation, where we provide the infrastructure platform, uh, legal policies, and the network to build uh, a blockchain ecosystem that can eventually uh, self-sustain and keep growing in the future. And a third pillar, which is the international leadership, uh, what, what, what we're trying to do here, basically, we're trying to establish Dubai as the global leader uh, in knowledge um, and development and implementation of the uh, blockchain technology. So in addition to uh, blockchain, in alignment with the UAE um, national AI strategy, Smart Dubai launched its own uh, AI roadmap to identify and develop use cases of uh, AI implementation across the city of Dubai. Uh, these use cases uh, are across all aspects of city services, uh, from police and security, from land department, um, education and environmental services. Uh, the AI lab is a vital innovation uh, around uh, this uh, fast-paced technology. Um, through 2018, we ran 20 workshops identifying over 100 possible use cases uh, of uh, AI within Dubai government. We've shortlisted uh, the top 43 use cases, and today we are building proof uh, of concept and pilots for them in partnerships with other uh, Dubai government entities. Next, please. Um, so once again, with AI as well, uh, we as a government entity, we want to provide the right guidance for all entities implementing the emer this emerging technology. So to ensure that all um, AI applications developed in Dubai are, are built in an ethical manner, in Jan 2019, we have launched the uh, Ethical AI Toolkit, which includes uh, principles and guidelines to be followed for the ethical development of AI applications. So along with the guidelines, we have developed a, a self-assessment tool, uh, which allows anyone implementing AI to self-assess their performance um, against a set of criteria, uh, which when taken together assures an ethical uh, approach. Um, as we know, uh, AI technology is still evolving. We have also formed a board with local and international members, uh, including the likes of Microsoft and Google, uh, to help continuously uh, revise the ethical uh, AI guidelines. And if anyone is interested in viewing our guidelines, you can find our ethical AI toolkit uh, on smartdubai.ae. Next, please. So um, finally, the last key activity we have been focusing on since uh, the inception of Smart Dubai is building a holistic data ecosystem. So it is commonly known and agreed upon that data is the fuel of the future, and therefore it's a key ingredient for the growth of emerging technology applications and uh, the ongoing development of smart cities. Uh, we can think of several applications of emerging technologies, but without having the right uh, data sets to feed the applications, we, we cannot get too far. So in harnessing the full potential of data, we can deliver great value for the city. And in Dubai, we have taken an all-inclusive approach to building uh, the city's data ecosystem, looking into the data governance, the infrastructure, and the ecosystem engagement. 
So um, our open data sharing platform, which is known as uh, Dubai Pulse, currently hosts over 600 different uh, government data sets, uh, which can be accessed by anyone across the globe. And we are soon launching the, uh, a decentralized data platform to encourage the exchange of data between the government and private sector. Um, as knowledge sharing is a key pillar for uh, Smart Dubai, I would like to conclude by inviting you all to join the Smart Cities Global Network, which brings leading smart city experts, uh, government leaders, academia, uh, non-government organizations, and other individuals in one platform to discuss the best uh, practices in smart cities uh, building um, and, implementing, um, and implementation. Uh, across the globe. If anyone is interested to, to join, please feel free to uh, sign up in scgn.smartdubai.ae. And uh, thank you once again for having me a uh, part of this webinar and taking the time to hear about the journey, a journey of Dubai's uh, digital transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rama, for this very insightful overview uh, of what the city and the Emirate of Dubai is about. Clearly, we are thinking forward uh, in Dubai. The Smart Dubai is not the only initiative in town, and uh, there is actually a lot of them like a puzzle that work in conjunction together. And one of these uh, key players is the Dubai Future Foundation to tell us what it focuses on. Gave Haman is here uh, to give us more. Gave, please put your mic on and here we go. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me again. These series have become a staple now every month, so I'm always looking forward to them. Uh, just a brief introduction about Dubai Future Foundation. Um, uh, if you can skip to the next slide, I'll, I'll jump right into it. So we were really met, created at the uh, on one of the uh, versions and editions of the World Government Summit as a future exhibition to showcase what future certain future sectors would look like, mainly government. So the focus was primarily on government and the role of government in the future. Um, the interaction was very positive and was great. Um, and there were a lot of moving pieces and the stars were aligned. Uh, Dubai Future Foundation was created to institutionalize uh, future shaping within the Emirate and not just within government only, but also in the private sector, but also within society. Um, and basically the aim of the foundation is to make Dubai a leading city of the future. Now I'll, I'll get into the details of what that means uh, through various initiatives that we take. Um, just onto the next slide, please. Um, basically, also the mission is to collectively imagine, inspire, and design Dubai's future. Um, we obviously can't do that alone. Uh, we can't do that even alone as a uh, government sector. We need the help of the private sector. So therefore, we aligned all of our initiatives under three major pillars, imagine, designing, and executing. Um, the imagining basically revolves around a lot of the future foresight, the, uh, the research, and the ways and the tools that we can disseminate this information both in Arabic and in English, given that we are in a massively uh, and dominantly Arabic speaking region. Uh, the design phase is put into uh, capacity building, uh, designing and accelerating, which is really the engine of the foundation and experiencing the future, which I'll get into. So building the capacity goes all the way from the ground root, from the ground level and from the from grassroots with initiatives like the Million Arab Coders, which aims to create the biggest cohort of, of Arab coders uh, um, around, all the way to top tier sea level uh, decision makers, both on the government level and the private sector level, where we provide specialized courses in future foresight, understanding emerging technologies, the impact it has on government and future sectors. Uh, and then when it comes to designing and accelerating the future, that unit, which is basically the unit that I work in, um, has Dubai Future Labs, which is a physical facility that creates um, um, tangible products, works on robotics. Uh, we have a massive facility here in Emirates Towers. You can always visit it. Uh, Dubai Future Accelerators, which is a startup government link up uh, program focused on linking up uh, technology startups from around the world with government challenges here in Dubai. Uh, as well as Palmwood, Dubai 10X, and Regulations Lab, which I lead. So I lead a lot of the programs with the private sector and the and the and the uh, technology startups, as well as the Regulations Lab, which focuses on creating new markets and new uh, uh, economic activity within the UAE based on 
pilots that are that sit outside of the current legal infrastructure in, in the UAE and how can we create new legal legal structures modify existing ones uh, and even cancel some 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 legal infrastructures that don't belong in the 21st century and don't enable the UAE to become a test lab for the biggest ideas and, and the most exciting technology in the world so it becomes like a piloting uh, uh, staging ground for all this technology to, to take place. Uh, and obviously the Museum of the Future, those of you who are in Dubai, you've seen it on Sheikh Zayed Road. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful building. Uh, there we'll be displaying a lot of uh, what we think and what we see is, is the um, a future interactions between society, technology, government government and technology, as well as private sector and technology, as long, along with other, other themes that we have. On the execution side, uh, naturally, we are a government entity and we rely a lot on the execution with our fellow government entities within Dubai, both from an execution and legislative perspective, but we also have a lot of partners in the private sector that help us do that as well. So that's really the, 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 the bolt on the, like the, 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 um, uh, the components that make up Dubai Future Foundation. The design phase is really the engine um, where, that operates a lot of our initiatives, executes them and brings them to the ground. Next slide, please. Um, so du Dubai story is, is quite well known. We've we've managed to accelerate our own growth. Um, the UAE is a startup nation. Uh, Dubai is at the heart of that nation, and everything that's been done in Dubai has been accelerated. So uh, the future it make, only makes sense for us to accelerate the future. Now everything that I talk, just talked about, uh, all these initiatives, all these projects, they happen within an ecosystem uh, called Area 2071. And the main pillars of Area 2071 are government, multinationals, and startups. And we're trying what we try to solve for within this ecosystem throughout all of our initiatives that I've just discussed is system level or sector level problems that don't just impact Dubai and the UAE, but impact uh, the world around us. And we have several of these programs, which you can see on our website, uh, with uh, corporates like uh, Procter & Gamble, uh, with uh, X labs like uh, the Aviation X lab, which is comprised of Emirates Airlines, Airbus, and a few other uh, massive corporations within the aviation industry. Again, solving for massive and systematic issues within the aviation sector. So we take on different sectors and we try to apply the same concept. Um, obviously, the benefits of being part of this ecosystem are various, uh, everything from um, a, uh, the, we offer the, the, the five-year entrepreneurship visa, uh, which has no sponsorship um, all the way to accessing all of our uh, uh, the platform which houses all of our programs and all of our challenges as well as our regulations lab as well as all of our other initiatives and uh, connecting with um, uh, other startups government entities and the private sector as well next slide please yes so Again, this is primarily where we sit. And I think the next few slides will talk about a little bit more about some of the programs that we have. So if you can skip to the next one. Um, yeah, so, so this, so this the, 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 the business unit that I just talked about is basically the engine, which brings together all these ideas and all these uh, uh, from around the world, be it in the form of uh, technology startups or established multinationals to pilot these ideas on the ground, making Dubai um, a lab for future ideas. Next slide, please. Um, a program that I briefly talked about, which is the Dubai Future Accelerators, uh, it's been going on now for seven cohorts. We're currently running the eighth cohort, which is predominantly going to be virtual. We used to have uh, seven cohorts, which were uh, very, very much um, um, on the ground. Uh, you have nine weeks to do all the business stuff that you need to do with the government entity that basically selects you to solve for it for you for, for their challenge. We've had 254 participating com uh, uh, companies from 30 plus countries around the world. So it's not just a regional program, it's a global program. And we've been able to launch around uh, a little over 60 pilots on the ground across different sectors from transportation and logistics to healthcare to uh, to to, uh, to energy uh, and infrastructure as well. A uh, few success stories we've had one with actually one of, with our colleagues in Smart Dubai, uh, and with Solar Bankers with uh, Dubai uh, with Diwa, 
uh, and loyal with, with Emirates Airlines. So Emirates Airlines participate with us both under the Buy Future Accelerators program and also on the Aviation X Lab. So they're very, very active with us. They strongly believe in the message of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, emerging tech, and the impact it has on the aviation sector and the, the global economy as a whole. So these are some of the success stories that we've had. Um, and year on year, we constantly launch new pilots. Uh, we're pushing both the boundaries of the regulations, but also the risk appetite the, that corporates have, that that uh, that the government has here in the UAE, uh, uh, by launching pilots that are daring, out of the blue, and constantly challenge the way that, that we function both as a government and as a private sector. Um, and again, the, this is this is a a. Uh, quick intro around uh, regulations level we already talked about it. The whole point is to create new markets, new, new, new economic sectors by creating more agile regulations. Uh, our, if you are a, uh, if you're, if you're a startup or a multinational that wants to launch a pilot and are facing regulation issues, you can always log into our website, um, uh, fill in the application, we'll get to you right away. Hopefully soon we'll, you'll hear about a few use cases which we're launching on the ground soon. Um, that, that, that were not around before and we're working very closely to make that happen hopefully within the next few months. Um, part of, so what we've done in the past is we've launched obviously Area 2071 uh, and Dubai Future Foundation, but we've done it a little bit in silo. Um, we've worked with other government entities, but we've formalized that, that engagement on the Dubai Future District, which we've done with DIFC and Dubai World Trade Center. Uh, to create a much more formidable offering for all uh, uh, innovation-driven enterprises or technology startups from around the world. Uh, everything from enablement uh, of uh, uh, setting, setting up here in, in the UAE to funding, to financing, and for more commercial traction within this market. Next slide, please. Um, and you could see the different services and different different responsibilities split between what DIFC has, but what Emirates Towers, which is predominantly where we sit at Dubai Future Foundation, and Dubai World Trade Center uh, lies. So these are these are uh, uh, services that were previously given out and uh, procured separately. Now they're under one roof under Dubai Future District. Next slide, please. And that's it. If you have any questions, I'd be happy, I'm more than happy to answer. Um, please feel free to share my email with the participants, happy to answer their emails. Uh, if there's any questions they have, also happy to jump on them now or a little bit later. Very good. Thanks a lot, Gaif, uh, for this overview of uh, the, some of the some of the very practical uh, things that are uh, being done to think outside of the box. Uh, yeah. And you talked about test lab, you talked about uh, agile regulations, and to me, uh, this probably no better success story for that than the financial center which is part of your uh of, of your chain here on the right so for that Definitely. i'll thank you guys and i'll jump to, to to ali uh to not only to tell us the story of the difc i mean uh, a a, com uh, a de an island of common law in a desert of of civil law but also how it has developed and what it has in stock for the future now it is a bona fide tier one financial center ali the floor is yours Thank you very much, Jan. Um, a very enthusiastic and gracious welcome. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted uh, to be representing Dubai International Financial Center today uh, as part of Team Dubai. Uh, the DIFC, for those who are unfamiliar, is a Dubai government initiative. It was established in 2004, uh, and it is now by substance and size uh, the largest uh, financial and professional services cluster in the Miasa region. But we're not resting on our laurels. We can see the innovation uh, that is going on. And over the last two years, we have firmly pivoted towards technology. And we have our future of finance strategy, which I'll touch upon uh, in a few moments. And we see that as a key driver of your opportunities and our future growth and success. So our success is your success and vice versa. Before we jump into um, that uh, side of things, I just like, I think it's worthwhile recapping uh, the uh, market opportunity that Miazza represents and the attributes of Dubai and DIFC as a hub, a digital hub uh, for that wider region. Next slide, please, Jan. 
So lots of uh, data points on this slide, but let me just summarize the key market fundamentals. So you have a region uh, that consists of diversifying and growth economies. You've got very supportive demographics, 40% uh, of the population under 25, uh, and you have uh, increasing demand for financial services in the region driven, yes, by uh, sovereign wealth pools, but increasingly by private wealth pools. And if you look at the digital penetration, it's very high. So 21% higher smartphone penetration in the GCC as compared to Europe, Africa and South Asia growing at around 30% an annum. That all underpins uh, the digital opportunity that we see uh, in the region. So this is, um, you know, so if Mianza is the opportunity, you know, why, why Dubai? And, um, you know, we have, again, a lot of supporting data to illustrate that. But in essence, Dubai has successfully built on its heritage as a commercial hub. And it is, it is a, a, a global commercial trading hub, um, but it's worked very hard. We've worked very hard to put in the hard and soft infrastructure to support business and also to provide the, the quality of life uh, to attract talent uh, into, uh, into the region, into the UAE and, it, and into Dubai. It is not a hardship posting. And indeed, post-COVID, uh, where there is a suggestion that people are going to be even more mobile, you know, Dubai stands out as one of those locations that is going to prove attractive uh, for individuals and families. And now turning to that uh, digital opportunity, uh, we see significant opportunity in digital as elsewhere. Uh, we're seeing an uh, acceleration in the adoption. Uh, we've seen initially the um, B2B segment uh, flourish, and now we're seeing uh, B2C certainly uh, accelerating in its growth. And e-commerce uh, in the UAE is growing at around 28% per annum. As we've heard from the other speakers, government is very proactive and on points, both the UAE federal and Dubai government really identify the digital economy as critical for the next phase of growth. And that underpins um, the potential success of, of the initiatives. Uh, and as Gates mentioned, DIFC is very much part of Dubai Future District, which is looking to support and nurture uh, di digital I innovation across a number of sectors, right? So it's financial services, but it's hospitality, tourism, logistics, aviation, uh, and, and so on. And our proposition, the DIFC's digital proposition, leverages off its existing substance, right? So. DIFC is ranked number one in the Miaza region as a global financial center. Uh, we have 90% of the market share in terms of uh, uh, financial services firms operating at international standards. There are 700 regulated entities. There are 27,000 people. All that is a ready-made cluster of potential clients, investors, partners, mentors uh, for tech firms that are coming. Next slide, please. And the secret source of our success has actually been um, something quite dry, which is our the clear independence of our financial regulator and the tried and tested common law legal framework that people have touched upon. And it's truly international. It's a global financial center, 143 nationalities. Yes, there are other satellite centers in the region, but they are fairly domestic in their uh, characteristics. Now it's important, the commonality of uh, regulations and laws allows business models and ideas and control frameworks operating elsewhere to be brought seamlessly to the region. So it gets rid of the, the friction of entering a new market to, to, many, to many degrees. And just as, as we're focusing on Switzerland this morning, um, the links between the DIFC and Switzerland are extensive, uh, and we've got some data points uh, to illustrate that in terms of the financial services firms that are here, the number of employees uh, that they have in the DIFC. But I'd also like to highlight the, 
technology growth that we've seen from uh, Swiss expertise coming to the market and engaging the opportunity. So we've already seen uh, Swiss tech companies set up and we'd love to see uh, 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 some more coming in as well. And in terms of the wider fintech scene in the Middle East, we've again got some uh, good data. Uh, these numbers are changing, of course. It's growing. Um, the DIFC is closer to, to 250 now rather than 150. But anyway, let's take 150. It's quite clear. The message is clear. There's vibrant growth in the region, and it's Dubai and DIFC uh, that's driving uh, the majority of that growth. Fintech Hive is our key focal point for digital businesses. It's an integral part of uh, the center, and it provides ready access to those potential clients I mentioned, but also sources of capital, whether that's private capital or indeed um, the DIFC's uh, participation in Dubai's Innovation Fund, uh, which is uh, uh, currently being uh, put together. We have a number of flexible and low cost market entry options. We have a full suite of programs, startup, acceleration and scale up, um, just to support tech companies throughout the different stages of their development cycle. And just a, uh, another data point that um, supports the continuing momentum that we've seen. So our regulator, the DFSA had the largest number of entrance for their innovation testing license um, that was held over the summer um, you know, during these challenging times. So I think that, that speaks volumes. And then just to, this is just again, some data in terms of the tech companies and, and the trend that we've seen as to who's come in. Uh, we've had a first wave that's been predominantly uh, unregulated. So SaaS um, providers, B2B providers, reg tech, uh, that's been the, the mix that we've seen. But as we've developed, and this is the, to Gaith's point, as we develop uh, the regulations, we're, we are seeing uh, uh, the, the regulated uh, innovators coming. So particularly payments, uh, we have a new payments regime in place, which is one of the most comprehensive uh, available. We've just launched a, a venture capital uh, regime for VC firms. And this is what we, we think we're going to see in the, in, in the weeks and months ahead. And as, uh, as with all my fellow speakers and Dubai, uh, Dubai's uh, general approach, the IFC is very forward looking. Uh, we absolutely recognize that technology is going to change uh, financial services. And we are responding in terms of our strategy uh, you know, going forward so that we are on a good position to capture that new wave of growth uh, that we see. And I think we're, we're getting, <laughs> we're probably at that tipping point, right? Uh, rather than it uh, uh, being at uh, some point in the future. Yeah, and then th this sets out the core pillars of our future of finance strategy, right? So it's uh, driven by two, two elements. One is the FinTech verticals. Um, that we see. So as I've mentioned, payments, but also digital banking, digital assets, uh, reg tech and Islamic finance, and then the enabling ecosystem providers, right? So VC, uh, the big tech platforms that in of themselves will attract capital talent and innovation uh, into, uh, into the center. And then just to give um, you know, our uh, build out, if you like, of, of regulations to support innovation. I mean, we recognize that you know, fintech models um, need um, uh, adaptation of regulatory regimes so that they can cover the regulations, cover the new products, the new assets, the new distribution mechanisms, and indeed the new risks. So regulation is very much an enabler uh, because it provides a consistent framework for market participants and consumers. And just to touch upon uh, a couple of um, the laws in the DIFC. We do have the um, data protection law uh, and, and DIFC is in discussions uh, with uh, European counterparts in terms of being viewed as equivalent. And we have intellectual property law, very important in terms of tech innovation. And then just finally, you know, we're very much tied in to the UAE and Dubai initiatives, um, including the central bank and its FinTech team and of course, uh, Dubai Future District uh, that we heard from 
previously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ali, for this uh, tour d'horizon of what the AFC is all about and has up its sleeve uh, going forward. We will provide two examples uh, just in a couple of minutes of how uh, the DIFC tools and structures and companies can be used by existing and uh, uh, startup uh, structure to create more value, raise capital. But before we do that, uh, I would like to wrap up this uh, roundtable of speakers with someone that is uh, not specifically from the tech or fintech industry, but someone that uh, is in charge together with his organization of representing uh, uh, Dubai and helping people to enter the market and grow here. Uh, so uh, without further ado, Walid Maroun, uh, please talk to us about the Dubai Advantage. Thank you, Jan. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and good afternoon to all the participants here in Dubai. Uh, it's given me a great pleasure to be today part of this uh, webinar as uh, Jan just gives a, a hint about Dubai Advantage. I'll go through Dubai Advantage to give you uh, a brief about what Dubai is offering and the different sectors uh, that we are focusing on this uh, lovely city. Talking about Dubai as a city, Dubai has a very diversity economy. As shows uh, on the screen here, the contribution of the GDP by 2019, the majority goes to the whole wholesales and retail trade, which is uh, contributed 26.6 uh, percentage of the total GDP, following by storage and transportation and uh, financial and insurance and so on. Dubai is a tourist, a tourist destination and being uh, a preferred destination for different uh, various uh, countries who came to Dubai, I would say, all over the year. Even although we have the hot weather, but at the, at the same time, it's a preferred destination uh, for some nationality to spend the summer here in Dubai on the exotic beaches and, uh, of course, the uh, indoors activities that are taking place here in the summer. In 2019, uh, we have approached on 2016, 0.73 million visitors. And the aim of 2020 uh, that has been set from uh, the leader of Dubai, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, to achieve 20 million visitors by the year of 2020, but due to the crisis that we, the whole world has faced, uh, we've been uh, facing some challenges to get this number. But nevertheless, by uh, July of this year, Dubai has opened the door for the whole world to come and visit Dubai and spend their uh, good time here uh, through the remaining of the year. Dubai as a gateway. Dubai has uh, a unique strategic location. Dubai occupies the uh, middle uh, uh, middle location of the of the world. Talking about the strategic location, it has an equal uh, timing uh, flying from east and west. Uh, this location has served 2.4 billion consumer direct market on the Middle East, Indian subcontinent, and East Africa. Uh, continue talking about the aviation and connectivity of Dubai. Uh, 140 airlines directly connected from Dubai International Airport to, to 260 destinations. Uh, talking about our uh, national carrier Emirates Airlines that has almost 170 plus destinations. Uh, which directly flying to the major cities on the world. Uh, 1,000 uh, plus, 8,000 8, plus uh, weekly flight. Uh, taking an example, we have 1,600 uh, plus flight uh, on a week between Dubai and India. That's given an opportunities for the businessman to close the deal within the same day uh, between the two countries. Uh, we are witnessing to host the biggest expo uh, in the region, uh, Expo 2020, which is supposed to be this year, exactly at this time of the, of the year, of the month. Uh, but due to the COVID-19, the committee has postponed the expo to 1st of October 2021 through third, end of March 2022. It will be the first time World Expo hosted on the Mansa region 
we are expected to have 25 million visitors. 70% uh, will be internationally. The theme of the expo is connecting mind and creating the future. And that, uh, the sub-theme, mobility, sustainability, opportunity. Uh, talking about the Switzerland pavilion, uh, the, the theme of the Switzerland pavilion will be a uh, sustainability theme, which will reflect the Swiss diversity from magnificent uh, landscape to innovate projects uh, for sustainable future. Uh, Dubai has a very strong and modern infrastructures for those uh, who's been visiting Dubai, uh, of course, on a regular basis, they will see the and will notice the changes from time to time happening on the city. Uh, in 2019, Dubai has launched the driveless, uh, driveless metro system, uh, which uh, serve major uh, places and business district on the, on the city and large shopping mall. Uh, we are aim by 2030 to expand uh, additionally 421 kilometer, which uh, I would say it's covering almost the major places on the on the on the city of Dubai. And Dubai has been ranked number three for the infrastructure investors. And this slide does give you the ranking of the year uh, Dubai as a city. It's most, most attract, attractive cities for FDI. The connectivity, uh, Jabal Ali uh, Airport is the first uh, region, Jabal Ali, and global, uh, and number nine globally. Uh, of course, it's uh, ranked number seven as well globally on the FDI magazine uh, and, and as aerospace cities. Dubai Plan 2021, uh, the plan addressed the city development uh, in all aspects, which divided into six pillars, as shows uh, a secure culture, uh, an entertaining place to live, and preferred business destination, uh, tolerance, uh, as well, multi-society, and a smart sustainability environment, and of course, the sustainable uh, economic growth. Uh, federal science technology, uh, 100, uh, sorry, to 82 uh, billion US dollar on the pool where it will be targeting 40% increasing in knowledge working by 2021. And uh, as shown on the slides, there are some sectors that will be uh, invested on uh, from the total budget, such as space sectors, uh, initiative and clean energy project and so on. Uh, talking about the technology, which is involving much more in the health uh, care, uh, as uh, Ms. Rahma Shehi from Smart Dubai mentioned about the uh, involving the technology on uh, the healthcare sector. Today, Dubai Health Authority uh, exploring the use of 3D printing uh, and different uh, treatments such as uh, prosthetic limbs and 3D printing on teeth. Uh, that also will be implemented mostly on public uh, clinic and hospital. Uh, we have noticed uh, during the COVID not required anymore to visit uh, the doctors. The telemedicine has been improved uh, during this uh, time of the, of, the, of the year as well. The applications were following the smart the smart city initiative has been launched in 2014. That all the medical reports, all the prescriptions will be on the apps. That will be just one click for the patient, where can get everything delivered to his inbox. Yes, I ended. Uh, by the slide before I just conclude uh, my presentation uh, again, Jan, I would like to thank you for the uh, for organizing this webinar. I would like to thank Mr. Ali, Mr. Ghaith, and Ms. Rahma for their continuous support uh, and alongside of uh, being alongside Dubai FDI to showcase Dubai as preferred investment destinations. Thank you. The city that redefines global connectivity. Dubai is where the physical and digital worlds find harmony. So your thoughts and visions find a global audience and your products and services find an unparalleled market.
where the confluence of business, events, lifestyle, and culture sparks unimagined prospects that know no boundaries. Imagine a future for your business. Now make it happen. So thank you to all our speakers. Now you have it. Uh, dynamic, high regulation, yet very creative and pushing the envelope place that is the perfect ecosystem for the business of today, but also the business to tomorrow. And uh, what I want to do to close is to give two illustrations of how some of these tools, some of these jurisdiction can be uh, used, taken advantage of by uh, high growth businesses to really turbocharge their growth. Uh, we often talk about the Dubai in terms of its free zone. And if you want to read about this, uh, we publish every year at MHQ, a very comprehensive review of all of these uh, free zone being compared about what they do. You can download it here by scanning it. Of course, there's the DIFC, the financial center, a themed focus free zone, but there's uh, many others. So depending on your need, you may want to look into what fits you, whether you need uh, an industrial free zone or you need uh, uh, something more focused on services. Do you want to be close to your peers, etc.? Location will matter. Uh, we talked about transportation. We also talked about staffing. Uh, your people want to live in a place where the quality of life is good, where it's easy to recruit. If you want to grow, you need good people. Uh, that location will play a role in choosing that jurisdiction. The price, of course, although I must say that due to COVID, the UAE and Dubai in particular have done a fantastic um, effort to provide incentives to people to start pretty much uh, cost free. At least that's what has been done for most of the year, particularly in the DIFC, which actually triggered a spike in application for regulated services providers in 2020. And then you have the branding and credibility. Uh, as a company, you are a brand, you're trying to building value, your partner, the jurisdiction you choose and the sub jurisdiction in it must meet that they must be aligned to create value over time and to be able to define where you want to be. Remember these four uh, questions. Uh, once you have the, these data, it is very easy for you to assess together with people have us or your provider, what, uh, what is the best jurisdiction for you? And let me show you that uh, with two examples. This is a typical new age business. Uh, some people somewhere around the world, they create some IP, they, it's uh, uh, some, some app, for example, and they package it and put it into uh, a structure. They didn't go uh, very further to, um, to talk about what they wanted to do. They just went, okay, any company will do, will it? Not really, because the moment they start to uh, hunt for seed money, any uh, investors will ask them, where are you set up? Is it a credible jurisdiction? Or we, for example, invest only in tier one financial center. Perhaps we invest only in common law jurisdiction. And that's where you will have some operational challenges if you try to uh, raise finance, if only to open a bank account, which can be very complicated if you have some sort of structure in a non-disclosed offshore jurisdiction. And that's often what happens. You can also have negative scrutiny. So what to do? Should you restructure? No, no need. You can simply migrate, which means transporting this entity uh, from one jurisdiction that is maybe rated slightly lower uh, in the uh, financial and structuring market scale to uh, business or even first class and come to the UAE and the DIFC. The DIFC, like many other UAE free zones, have a migration regime which enables a company to shift, to upgrade while maintaining uh, a low cost and no tax uh, status. And then over there, it can grow. It can build up, bulk up, and morph into something that becomes effectively a bona fide operational structure. So it starts in life with something a little bit shaky, but a very good idea. And by migrating, building up, growing, it can create value over time. Another good example is this. This is an existing company. It can be here, it can be abroad. Let's assume it is here uh, with two founders and they do need to raise finance. So what should they do uh, to attract people is to say, look, 
we as an operating entity are credible, but can we become more credible and actually go and seek funding from others? Yes, you can do that rather easily by setting for example, a holding in the Dubai International Financial Center. By doing so, you lift your shareholding into a common law framework, which is familiar to many people in the financial industry and which will give credibility to your organization, increase the value of your organization, facilitate the, uh, the funding into it by third party investors because they will know they will be able to trust the system, trust the court, everything done in English. So these are just two simple examples of how the UAE tools and structure can be used. But of course, there is many. And if you have any question as to how you can take advantage of the Dubai Hub, its tool, its regulation, feel free to ask us now through uh, the chat or otherwise uh, to ask any question you would like to, to some of the speakers that would still be online. We welcome the chat for anyone. Um, hello, my name is Vincent Guineau from the Capafric Group. Uh, in the case of the lift you just described, um, I, my experience is that when your DMCC structure, for example, is owned by another company, uh, the KYC paperwork can be slightly more cumbersome. Is there some, some facilitation or agreement between the IFC and DMCC to make it uh, specially uh, easy or is just as if you were in any other jurisdiction? It's a very good question. I think if you're comp it's a question of number of um, uh, corporate liars and whether your entity here in the UAE or is it abroad? Uh, I assume in your case, the structure would be abroad. If this is the case, having a DIFC holding of a DMCC is very simple. This is why most of UAE businesses now are being restructured using a new product that the DIFC has launched to with a lot of success, which is called a DIFC prescribed company. It is effectively the DIFC telling, look, entrepreneurs around, we understand that you are here, you already provide value to this country and to this city. Why don't you use a DIFC holding uh, that is a bona fide holding, but at a fraction of a cost? How much do you think such a tool costs? Two and a half thousand dollars. So today, if you are a business regionally and you meet a certain number of criteria in terms of size and, and AUM, et cetera, you can have a DIFC holding for that price, no need for an office. This is completely okay. new and it's- That's very interesting. Yeah. And uh, another difficulty we, fi we find is that it's not so easy to transfer shares uh, to new shareholders or or between shareholders in the UAE, we, we find the procedure is much more cumbersome than in jurisdictions hours. like the Mauritius or, or the BVIs, where, where it's just one form, you sign it, you send it, and uh, within a few days it's done. We have found uh, in Dubai it has been much more difficult. Have they, have they simplified that either in the MCC or the IFC or both? So good news on the horizon. The reason why this used to be very simple in the UAE was because the regulation were not very good. That was 15, 20 years ago. At the time, it was very, very easy, if you recall, if you had experience with the jurisdiction then. And then came all the regulation. And this triggered much more scrutiny, KYC, AML, which is a good thing because it credibilized the jurisdiction. The last step, which is good news, being implemented now by uh, the DFC and other regional centers is corporate services provider laws. And that will allow the center to pass some of the scrutiny to corporate services providers like MHQ that operate from the DFC and streamline the process so that it will become much easier, very similar to what you described in a slightly lower caliber jurisdiction. So to you, uh, the, the, this facility will arrive in the DIFC first and then will trickle down to the MCC. But I believe that within 2021, you will have most of the Dubai key registrar will be fully automatized 
digitalized and much smoother than what you used, to, uh, what you were used to, I would say two or three years ago. There's also noticeable improvement. Today, if you want to set up a foundation in the DIFC, where you want to set up anything in the DIFC, everything is digital already. You never, you do not even need to go. Everything is done by DocuSign. So that that is key, and I think we are on the right path uh, in terms of that. Uh, one note on that. The UA used to be a very easy place to do business, to set up a business and to do business. And with the regulation, it went down slightly, uh, about around the 30th in the world mark. It has come up noticeably and is on a path to all, ever simplify its business. And I think the fact that you can do almost everything with an app now is going into the right direction. Thank you, uh, Jan. There is a, a question from uh, Avadesh uh, Gupta with respect to uh, uh, regulatory structuring for digital asset uh, and whether the UAE uh, planning is similar to securitization as a Swiss Luxembourg laws. Any Ali, uh, are you able to answer this query? Uh, yeah, I, I can certainly start, uh, Jan. Um, so uh, it, it, it's uh, very relevant and to point the DFSA, the, the regulator in the DIFC, is about to issue a consultation paper on crypto uh, assets and, and their approach to crypto assets. They did issue a discussion uh, document uh, um, um, in conjunction with Deloitte early, earlier this year on on this on the custody and safeguarding of digital assets. I mean, this is obviously, as you appreciate, an evolving area, but I think that um, you know the DFSA are indicating their willingness to engage. Anything that the DFSA does will be um, broadly in line with with international standards, with some tweaks around the edges to. Uh, to take into account the, the local context. Um, but yeah, that, that consultation paper is due out uh, imminently, you know, certainly by, by the end of this year. So um, if you can provide me with your details, happy to send that through when it's available or, or you can monitor the DFSA website. Yeah, and um, MHQ and our sister firm, uh, uh, Rethink, which is active in regulatory compliance, will be publishing uh, on that. We're also closely monitoring that. Thank you very much, uh, Ali. I have another uh, question. Yeah, if I can uh, jump on the same question, Jan, if yeah, you don't mind. Yeah, feel free. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so so we so with the regulations lab, we received several requests and use cases from uh, several regulators here in, in the UAE w that are working with a few startups that are working on tokenization of assets. Um, that's both physical and financial assets. So you should hear about this in the next few months in terms of a pilot that's being run within a sandbox um, uh, environment um, to test whether, you know, first of all, what the, what the due diligence is, what the impact is on the local economy and what potential it can open up. So if you stay tuned, uh, if, if you have a use case, first of all, that that, that is tangible and that we can look at, please feel free to apply on the Regulab website. Um, uh, if not, then if you know if you want to wait to see the results, obviously you can you can find them in the next few months. We'll announce them on on our website as well. Thank you very much for the input, Kay. Uh, I have another uh, question on the log. We we talk a lot uh, about uh, real estate in, in in Dubai. We love real estate, and ever since uh, real estate was open to uh, non uh, GCC national. Uh, the quest was always to find the best structure there is to hold UAE real estate safely through a robust structure, uh, but that is not insulting people intelligence in terms of price. I'm delighted to tell you and to answer this question, there is now a way of doing so by using a DIFC structure. If you are a qualified applicant, and there's a definition for that, you can use a DIFC prescribed company to hold uh, Dubai real estate, no problem at all. Uh, if you are not a qualified applicant, then you can simply set up a DIFC foundation and own a real estate directly or through one of these prescribed companies. Many regional families are restructuring using those uh, and it has been designed and built for the regional market first and foremost. And you can clearly see a lot of momentum on that. These are now very well accepted by banks, by the land department. So uh, yeah, it exists and I'm happy to drop you a note on the, to illustrate the point on how it works. We have now 
I'm afraid uh, past the, the hour mark happily. Uh, do not worry, because if you have any uh, additional question, feel free to uh, drop a note to uh, our speakers. Uh, they are here directly and available. Uh, they are very knowledgeable and very uh, proactive. I know I deal with them uh, very often. So feel free to reach out directly to them. And otherwise, uh, feel free to reach to us at uh, MHQ. Uh, we sit in both Dubai mainland and the DFC. So hopefully we'll be able to guide you in either way. So for us at MHQ, thank you very much uh, to uh, the, our speakers and we'll see you soon on the way out. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.